Okay, uh, so my Petra Kucha um, is about a system session that I ran with OCHEAD um, followers, many of whom are here. Um, so what is systems theory, in, uh, very briefly? Uh, it assumes, one, that uh, the world doesn't work according to simple cause and effect, um, but rather it's a messy tangle of, of, of interrelationships between multiple factors. Um, secondly, it assumes that untangling that mess requires the knowledge and perspectives of all who have an interest in the particular situation. Uh, so in the session, we had three questions. Um, the first of them was, uh, what is the purpose of Occupy? Uh, two was, how should that purpose be achieved? And three, why is it important? Um, basically, everybody wrote the answers on th their own ideas on post-it notes, uh, and we uh, stuck them together on a, uh, on a board. Uh, they were organised according to similarities and differences, and that fueled a discussion. Now, in whole systems theory, it's the discussion um, and the learning that results from that discussion that's important, uh, not the post-its. And what struck me about the, uh, the discussion was the extent of the agreement amongst everybody, uh, which I had been kind of led to expect heated arguments from my social media experiences, but actually that really wasn't the case. Um, and uh, today I'm going to present, there are quite a lot more uh, than, than seven, but I'm going to present seven of the insights that came from that discussion, which I hope uh, um, are shared by everybody who was in that session um, and also, I hope, hopefully, they're bleeding obvious. Because if they are, then we're in agreement on something. So, insight one is that uh, followers saw Occupy as of the people and for the people. Um, they, uh, it, it is a movement that transcends and is independent, in a sense, of all other organisations. Um, there was uh, concern that because of this, uh, partnerships were a little bit risky in that, you know, we could be risking the essential qualities of that idea by getting too close to other organisations. Uh, nevertheless, it was recognised uh, by people that the, that the high-profile support um, could and had uh, delivered some really useful PR for the movement. So the solutions that were proposed were that partnerships should be one way and arm's length only. Um, what that means is they're limited to allowing or inviting other organisations to sign up to the people's aims and principles. Um, and uh, for me, there's also implications here for um, Occupy chapters, for if they become a political, a political entity or take on a formal, uh, formal organisation, they are in a sense shooting themselves in the foot if, if this agreement is widely shared. Uh, insight two. Now, this is the most powerful theme, and it's already been talked about quite a lot this evening already. Uh, the most powerful theme that came out of the uh, discussion was this idea of a viable alternative um, or a uh, competing narrative was a term that was also used. Uh, now what I'll try and do is outline, I'm not going to talk about content because then we'll get a, into an argument, so I will outline some of the structural principles um, of that viable alternative uh, and I'll try and couch them in kind of qualifying questions, i.e. questions that you might ask somebody on the street. Uh, so the first one is in the top left-hand corner, and it relates to power. So should people have a greater involvement in the decisions that impact on their lives and their futures? And if the answer is yes, then you're Occupy. Equality. Would it be a better world if the gap was reduced between rich, the richest and the poorest? Um, values. Uh, would the world be better if quality of life and well-being, in a general sense, uh, was valued over material and status-driven self-interest? 
If your answer is yes to both, then you're occupying. Uh, Worldview. Are the bigger challenges that face mankind connected? Uh, might addressing one problem um, have posit positive knock-on beneficial effects for other problems? Thinking. Um, should the well-being of future generations and the long-term viability of life on our planet be an important consideration in current decision making? <laughs> if your answer is yes, then you're occupying. So, what actions does this imply? Uh, number one, if these principles are shared, I believe that they were shared by the people in the group from things that were said, but if they're widely shared, uh, then they're ideal for underpinning organisation and ideas of solidarity. Um, secondly, the idea of the viable alternative is a wholly positive idea. Um, it's about a happier and a better future for all. Um, so whilst it's necessary, and we all know this, whilst, whilst it's necess necessary to highlight the, the um, necessity for urgent change, often that news is, is quite depressing and that can be off-putting for people. Um, so it just struck me that emphasising these principles uh, might have greater resonance for the 99% because they're just really positive, um, if they agree with them, that is. So, number three, uh, the, this viable alternative is a collective vision. Uh, this has also been kind of touched upon this evening. Uh, now, the belief in what I would say the urgent necessity for change, uh, which was shared by that group, was seemed to be underpinned by um, an, the idea uh, of the extent and the interconnectedness of the issues involved. Uh, and each person had their own view of, of how those issues were connected. And, you know, the, the lady that talked earlier was right. Though these, these partial views depended on their personal experiences, their personal areas of interest. And I, I'm talking personally from, from actually engaging with the Occupy movement and the news feeds and, and talking to people within the group. So there's some social learning in there as well. Uh, now, much of the divisiveness that I have seen within Occupy seems to be related at this very superficial level. Um, it's, it's basically people talking at each other um, and thinking that person represents a position, um, when in fact they're just conflicts of, of this partial view of the situation, these superficial partial views, uh, i.e. disagreements over what one's personal experience has led one to believe the, the problems are and the remedies and the actions. Uh, however, the, uh, the post-its, if you... I'm going to use a James Cameron uh, phrase, uh, represented a uh, Mongolian clusterfuck of gargantuan proportions. Um, and, you know, this, this implied that only highly situation-specific problem-solving uh, problem was needed, and that in any of those highly specific problems, um, it was inconceivable that any one person could know the answer. Um, there are no experts. Now, with it all up there on the board, I think this was, was, was recognised and, and it, this recognition drove processes where, where these experiences were really valuable tools for negotiating and informing a dynamic model of now. It wasn't a model of the future, it ended up being a, a dynamic model of, you know, how things are absolutely now. Uh, and, and rather than disagreements about over whose view was right or wrong, um, that it, you know, all in a sense were appreciated as being valuable and being um, partially right. Uh, there was also a lot of learning, uh, maybe not for everyone else, but certainly for me. So, what are the implications of this? Um, I thought one was that you know, arm everybody with with basic moderation skills um, and collective decision making tools. Uh, because, you know, even if there are five people in a room, they can, they can create fantastic decisions 
um, if it's done in the right way. And talking at people is not the way to do it. It's putting stuff on a board and talking about that board, uh, in my humble opinion. Um, and trust me, if I can do it, then it, it's not difficult. Um, secondly, uh, I felt that, you know, you stress that when, when, when a follower subscribes to these deeper principles, if they're aware of them, um, then they need to recognize that, you know, whilst they have a right to express their personal view, it's, if it's not braided into a collective decision, then it's not Occupy. Um, you know, a lot of people seem to see Occupy as a, a platform for barking about what they, you know, what they believe. But, but you know, in that, in that room, I felt it was all about braiding those decisions into what to do right next. Not what to do, you know, five years from now, but what to do next. Um, and lastly, if, uh, you know, if change is motivated by joined up, joined up worldviews, then, you know, perhaps the information that's really stressed should be, should be stories that connect social and environmental and economic issues, that, 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 you know, have resonance for people, but also make them go, wow, I hadn't thought that was connected to that. Um, or, more importantly still, is and I think I, th I think actually Occupy does this really well. I have to say, but but fast track people um, to contributing to those collective decision making processes uh, because certainly from my own experience, it's difficult not to join the dots when you're exposed to those di diversity that diversity of people and ideas. The Occupy ecology. So four. Successfully implementing the viable alternative depends on recruiting and mobilizing the 99%. Anyone disagree with that one? Um, so it followed from this that it, we cannot do this without human and financial resources. And, and it seemed that when we were talking about it, there, would, there were no shortcuts to this. Uh, a related insight uh, was that we need to play the guardians of the current system at their own game, um, outwitting and outmaneuvering them. And part of this um, involved exploring channels that they don't or can't easily use themselves. Um, because when we use the same channels, as we know, we get locked down quite frequently. Um, another part of this was uh, delivering uh, solid evidence supported messages evidence being really kind of you know was recognized to be really really important both in terms of the um, you know the references for those resources and the evidence itself uh, as non controversial as possible uh, the message needs to be simple um, it needs to be relevant this is something that's often forgotten relevant to the the specific needs um, of the specific target audience that it's aimed at. Because what emerged in that discussion was that actually, you know, the, the younger people had totally different ways in to occupy and they were looking for different messages. You know, it was more about the social aspect, for example. So exploring that will really benefit um, um, occupy. Uh, for example, uh, it also needs to be in clear, popularly understood terminology, um, which is pitched at the right level of understanding. And it was quite insightful, I thought, that in the session, uh, socio-environmental justice was not understood by, by several people, and they admitted it. So some of the stock phrases that we use, yeah, some of the stock phrases that we use um, are not known. Uh, this suggests that, you know, smart, uh, research-driven info and resource management is, is vital to success. So a quick recap of the challenges. One, uh, we Occupy needs to organize without being organized. It needs to communicate a viable alternative when none can conceivably be known. Uh, it needs to create solidarity when disagreement is, is actually inbuilt into its fabric. And it needs to use channels not covered by the ubiquitous um, uh, guardians of the current system whilst building volunteers, uh, funding, and critical mass. What was the solution? 
grassroots. Uh, explore local community issues uh, door to door and where solutions align with the viable alternative, um, start a grassroots campaign where action is informed by the Occupy deeper principles, um, at particularly inclusive collective decision making. There were some great ideas, but I don't have time to discuss them now. And, and lastly, I personally think um, this, this has uh, uh, important considerations for the organisational design of, um, of Occupy. Uh, less rapid growth give emergence to a hierarchy. Uh, this is the spoiling of many, many great NGOs. Um, and in Occupy's case, it, it would be violating um, a fundamental principle, a self-destructive hypocrisy. So, you know, a, a, a model of cross-pollinating structures, uh, cells uh, structured around local action um, and, you know, uh, principles of our viable alternative, again, for a future session. Uh, so, to conclude, um, at the heart of the um, Occupy movement seems to be this idea of the viable alternative which really is a, uh, the current system completely turned on its head. Um, it's a total paradigm shift, but it's necessity for um, you know, our endurance on the planet. But, but personally, I think it's okay, because the principles of the viable alternative aren't new at all. Arguably, they, and, and not those of the current system, are the ones that have dictated how we deal with our family and friends um, since time immemor immemorial. So people just need to realise that the whole world can work that way. Um, and I guess that's what we're going to help them to do. OK, you put quite a lot of emphasis on the 99% there. What about the other 1%? Are we not a collective, a 100%? Is that not alienating a group of people that could help us overcome these issues that you're talking about? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Um, the, the, uh, but... You know, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that those 1% are, you know, uh, running the world in their own interests. And, and I feel like I need to get everybody here that was involved in, in, in that session to answer that question. Uh, but, but I, you know, I feel that there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests those 99% are driving quite, um, you know, the harmful, destructive practices that we're seeing socially, economically, and environmentally. It's just a term, you know, it, but it's just one that's quite useful. Well, I was just meaning about the, the particular paradigm, as in a lot of people within that 99% will serve their own interests as well, but maybe not as destructively as the 1%. But, I mean, are you going to put them out of the 99% because they are self-serving, or are you going to try and educate them and find a way to be, you know, more serving of the whole rather than of the self? Um, again, it's not my decision. It should be everyone's decision. But if you're asking me... Um, the, uh, you know, if people are involved in collective decision-making processes, they generally come up with the decision that's right, will necessarily come up with the decision that's right for everybody. Um, so I would be looking for action that, that, that makes people, not makes people, that gets people involved in those processes. Um, you know, the evidence suggests that when you get lots of people together and they make a decision about a situation, um, it's usually quite an ethical and a correct one.